Hello and welcome to the Kuyamunga Institute, our Q&A conversation for exploration series. I'm Paul Rivera, the Executive Director and President of the Institute, along with my wife, Laura Lee, the Director of Research, Education and Outreach, and on behalf of our Board of Directors, our advisors, our volunteers and supporting members, we really want to thank you for joining us today. Uh, the Kuyamunga Institute is an independent nonprofit research organization committed to researching consciousness and the human experience, following the footsteps of our founder, anthropologist, Dr. Felicitas Goodman. And our focus is reflected in three main areas, experience, education, and exploration. We respect the path of academic balance, the creative pursuit of science, while advancing, conserving, and restoring a direct experience of that deeper human connection to all of life. So it's part of our mission to expand our own experiential research with the multidisciplinary uh, understanding that's available to us today. So as an educational institution, we take an open approach and we invite scholars in related fields to help broaden the scope of our own work and exploration. And that's why we call this conversation for exploration. These weekly Sunday discussions are available on demand. We have a couple hundred presentations between webcasts and YouTube videos and podcasts and all of that stuff. And as a nonprofit, of course, we invite you to become a supporting member. And we want to thank you, the community members who continue to support the mission of the Kuyamunga Institute. So today, we're going to continue to look to the dynamic geometry of sound itself and that process of making sound waves visible. There's a powerful coherence revealed as sound waves manifest as they vibrate into geometric patterns and waveforms like mandalas. This is known as cymatics, that this is the term that was coined by uh, Swiss physician Hans Jenny. And our guest today, Jeff Volk, he's the author, the producer and publisher, uh, maintains the rights and takes care of these publications of Hans Jenny's books on cymatics. And we're excited today to launch a long-awaited release of the newly revised editions of these publications. And Jeff also plans to give us some overviews and demonstrating Yeni's experimental setups, how it was how it was created more than 50 years ago, and looking at how today what we how it's come forward and how the work has manifested itself in new ways. Well, let's put this into context because cymatics is important and doves tell us so nicely with our personal and our institute's mission of opening the bandwidth to see further and farther and deeper into the nature of reality. And let's go back to what Buckminster Fuller said about this. Until the 20th century, he said, reality was everything humans could touch, see, smell, hear. Since the initial publication of the electromagnetic spectrum, humans have learned that what they can touch, smell, see, and hear is less than one millionth of reality. Our senses aren't adequate to the task alone. We need, we need instrumentations on this. We need to activate our inner technology. That's our story, more on that later. But 99%, said Bucky, percent of all that is going to affect our tomorrows is being developed by humans using instruments and working in ranges of realities that are non-humanly sensible. 99% of who we are, he said, is invisible and untouchable. And so this is exciting to see various simple ways, just simple off-the-shelf technology to help open up that bandwidth and make what's invisible visible. And starting with sound waves, you and I live in some interesting architecture where we notice the acoustics. What if we could see the sound waves mm. bouncing and flowing around the room? how much more of our reality we would understand. What if we could see some of these invisible waves? Cymatics is a really beautiful way of making that visible. And so Jeff, like our first interview was in the 1990s, right? Yeah. And so we've been talking with Jeff for decades and it's exciting that uh, the last time I spoke with him, I said, Jeff, you know, how widely into our culture has this phenomenon of cymatics of making visible these patterns of sound and how they move and the beautiful patterns they make. How widely has this captured our collective imagination? How has it become part of our wider conversation, the go-to illustration for widening our perception of the energy in the fields around us, bringing a bit more of that into view from the arts to the sciences, 
So many people have picked this up, ourselves included, which I'll conclude with today. Um, but Jeff, with the publication, the reissue of a new version of Cymatics, your book, um, you have included a lot of those stories. So we're here to discuss Cymatics and really how it's percolated into the culture. And welcome back. Welcome back. Thank you. Well, one thing I would say is we uh, originally, Yeni published two books back in 1967, a bilingual edition of volume one was published. That means some of the books were in German, some of them were in English. Yeah. Then volume two came out in 72. And I distributed those two books until we ran out of them. And, and now then, they're going for hundreds and hundreds of dollars on the secondary market, aren't they? For yeah. used copies, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the secondary market, that's a polite way of saying Amazon scalpers, right? <laughs> yeah, that's it. A book so yeah. I just wanted to make clear that the core of this book, this reissue, this our fifth edition of publishing Han Jianyi's two volumes, first one came out in 2001 with the two volumes combined. Mm. That was three weeks before September 11th. Mm. And I was pretty sure that I was going to die with four tons of ballast in my barn at that point. Mm. Well, not only did we make our 20% desired outcome for that year, as, the, as FedEx Ground was closing, we were shuttling books in there to go to New Leaf Distributing. And when we tallied up our years of, of uh, sales, mm -hmm. it was exactly 20% of the first print run had run in spite of the fact that we were dealing with a calamity. A and this was a $60 down. arcane science book. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when I saw all the crazy things happening with the publication of this edition, I kept just saying, okay, spend the money, it'll come back. You mm -hmm. know, this is something that the better you make it, the more people will accept it who don't know about it, and the more people will eagerly grab them up who do yeah. know about it. Yeah. So, but introducing it in such a way that the impact and the, it, it's a very, I wouldn't say imposing, but Intriguing. daunting, maybe not be, uh, yeah. wouldn't be Pulls you in. incorrect to say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's not easy reading. And um, at the end of our presentation, I will give a little bit of either the publisher's introduction or the publisher's closing, depending on where we are in our talk. Yeah. And the way I'm going, it might be the introduction. <laughs> well, let's yeah. define cymatics for those who aren't familiar with the term. And first of all, spell it. C-Y-M-A-T-I-C-S. What is it, what is it oh. derived from? Yeah. Uh, cheerleaders, high school cheerleaders, I think. It's, it's yeah. much better than yeah. uh, quantum <laughs> physics. Yes, yes, yes. And is Yenny <laughs> the one that coined the term? Or was that yes. a term? Yes, Yenny of... coined, coined the term from the Greek. Yeah. A Y M A T I, either C or K, depending what language you're talking. But in Greek, it's kima. Kima means waves. Uh, okay. So Yeni was uh, entitling the book A Study of Wave Phenomena and Vibration. So it made sense for him to use the term kimatic, or in German, I think it is kimatic in German. I don't speak German, so <laughs> even with a name like Volk, I should know better. But So in this first hour, we want to really define cymatics and just give a quick overview. You've got video clips to share. We want to talk about those many artists and uh, scientists, researchers who've used cymatics in various ways, even for movie um, intro mm. illustrations. I mean, it's been widely out there. And then we'll take uh, questions and comments from our audience, but um, you know, it's exciting to see something, how readily people pick up on it, make use of it. And also for me, it's exciting with what simple technology you can use for people to demonstrate this themselves. Mm -hmm. We've been in a Templar chapel with a whole demonstration on somatic yeah. set up mm -hmm. um, with John Stuart Reed. We've, mm -hmm. um, we've just, you know, we've talked to artists who've set up tripods and here's a little membrane and let's demonstrate this for kids. So it's, it's exciting how accessible it is. And well, um, I was actually okay. trying to answer your question before I deviated a little bit. <laughs> That's okay. But I wanted to just express that the back part of the book after volume one and volume two is a whole section of commentaries on cymatics by people who had a lot of experience with it 
Uh, Ralph Abrams had a wonderful little, Ralph Abrams is a mathematician who's worked with Rupert Sheldrake, Terrence McKenna. They know, uh, put together the uh, trialogues of East and West. So he's introduced a lot of the uh, psychedelics into mathematics, mm -hmm. but he met, he of all the 15 people who I had interviewed, he's the only one, including me, who had met Hans Yeni. Okay. Um, he basically said, meeting Yeni changed the course of my exploration and my understanding of mathematics. Mm -hmm. So he's no slouch and neither is Hans Yeni, neither was Hans Yeni. Right. So there are many people in that back section, several of whom will be interviewed on your show, I'm sure, who have brought this forward. But then there are also artists and artisans who've incorporated it in their own work in very unique and creative ways. So it's not just the science of it. And this is actually something that Yenny had brought up at the end of his book. He said, I want the makers as well as the explainers yeah. to understand cymatics and to put their perspective into the world so that people will be essentially just as excited about it as we are who have studied it for longer periods of time. So, um, you know, it's interesting to me to note that, well, explain the setup of cymatics. How do you give a quick elevator speech on what it is? I would say that the, um, the gist of it is making the invisible visible. And because sound is imperceptible to the human eye. And most of our understanding comes through the human eye. We read, we gauge all sorts of um, things to pay attention to through the eye. Not that we don't through the ear, but the eye gives us more of a sense of articulating our world. And the ear generally has more of a sense of orienting us in the world without mentalizing or abstracting. So it's a very visceral sense. Um, being able to convey how vibration or resonance or pulsation or oscillation, depending on whether it's a living being doing this or quote, inert matter being done to by this. And that I could take issue with because in essence, by the fact that something is in matter, it is material, it is not inert. It's apparently inert if it's not moving or burning up or doing something that we can see as a dynamic process. But everything is oscillating, vibrating, constantly coming in and out of form. The fact of the matter is, there is no matter. And if I wanted to go off on another tangent, I'd go into that poem, but I won't. So what I, find, uh, what I find interesting is that sound going through a medium is rather like the wind go blowing through a field of wheat, right? You can see it as it goes through the medium. Mm. And so what's always fascinated me is that how the sound waves behave. And so those little particulates on the yes. membrane that you'll be showing us, they are going to the quiet zone. They're being right. shoved from they're, the energetic zone into the quiet zone. They're settling in to the points zone. of least resistance. Right. Ah, good and so when you me. think about, you know, us being vibrated as well, sound coming through all these invisible waves, not just sound, but other parts of the spectrum, you can think about how it's affecting us mm -hmm. and our membranes, our matter, our, our being. And so it's just interesting to see how, and to live in a sea of vibration. It's making that visible in one little tiny Petri dish in effect, but right. think of it as the whole cosmos being sung by all these sound waves like air over guitar strings mm -hmm. right so it's or just like thoughts and feelings activated. over your nervous system oh another beautiful analogy yeah 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 so i mean this is impacting us this is making visible what's happening to us on on levels that are are fully part of the spectrum well, since we are talking about a visual medium, I think it is appropriate for us to do some imagery think, as we go along yeah, and have the discussion with some imagery. So, so I'll just give you permission. Right. Yeah, and Chris is going to run the technology from the background. Or the the Jeff. Jeff Wizard to Cymatics yeah. Mission. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so before we do that, I want to okay. introduce the next man up on stage here. I could call him my best man because he <laughs> has definitely been totally essential to the birth of this, or the, the marriage, to keep the metaphor, of the old and the new here, being able to bring it up to form and um, doing it in a an artistic and 
flawless, as flawless as is possible. We'll find that out when it comes off the press, how close we came. We will be talking about that book quite a bit because it's really compiling and bringing forward a lot of what Yeni had wished to do uh, had he lived more than 68 years. Mm -hmm. So, um, And because it's such a visual medium. That's yes, the point of it. Yes. Well, yeah. what we do have here, Chris is actually a book designer, um, oh. amongst many other things, and a graphic artist, and a computer whiz, and a number of other things. And he came into my sphere a long time ago through an art project called Colors in Motion, which oh. is, uh, he became the video compositor of still art to turn it into a very slowly morphing uh, imagination inducing art form. And Chris and I worked together on that project for probably 10 years before the need to reprint this book came up. Perfect. Jeff. So Chris has suggested in when we were talking about this project, and I didn't even know he was going to be here to run the tech and to do that stuff, uh, except for a couple of days before we, we put the thing on. So this has been a great relief. Yeah. And I want to say that what Chris suggested was brilliant that we start with the clip of Yenny, which I had wanted to do anyway, but I had gotten fully sidetracked before we got there. So the clip that we're gonna show is called Vibrating World. Is it world or worlds? World, singular. It is um, a copy of a 16 millimeter film that Yenny made in order to show the dynamics of cymatics. And I remember, um, Paul, you had entitled this the uh, sacred cymatics and sacred geometry or something like that mm -hmm. and i quickly changed it to the dynamics of sound or the yeah. dynamics of of geometry of yeah. geometry thank you yeah. the dynamics of geometry it's a because, moving medium yeah well it is extremely important to see this in motion if you see just the still uh photographs or images mm -hmm. what you get is the structural component which is only half of the picture. Mm -hmm. The other half of the picture is the dynamic aspect. So when you see what's actually making those geometric forms is an oscillating, pulsating, resonating mass of inert substances. What a moment ago had just been sand or powder sitting on a, on a steel plate, all of a sudden gets transformed into these living, breathing mandalas or things that look like forms in nature, like the way your hair comes out of the top of your head or the way the a bone- Nautilus shell. Uh, what kind of cactus, a Christmas cactus is it that comes out in the perfect Fibonacci series or the double offsetting Fibonacci arch, which <laughs> determines where the seeds show up in the, um, in the sunflower seed head. Yeah. They flow up at the arching points of a left-handed and a right-handed Fibonacci spiral. Yeah. yeah, And because we are human beings who are material beings, we cognize materially. Uh, that may not be because, may not be causal, but as, a, as, a, uh, as an artifact of that, we make things physical or material, where in fact they're oscillatory. Mm -hmm. They're always coming into form and moving out of form. We live in an on-again, off-again world. It makes it appear as if I were here speaking to you as if we were two. I'd like to ask Chris to cue up Vibrating World, which was done in the late 60s, taken by Yenny's assistant for um, showing the work in motion. All right, but, thank you, Chris. Let's see. Yeah. Jeff, did you want to also follow this? So there's two videos we have as well. The one that follows this as well, that is Christian Student, who was working with Yenny um, actually, and Laura Lee, you had said, you know, it's, you've seen this before where there's actually experiments you can do at home <laughs> where you can actually try this. Um, and Christian does a great job of showing that in, a, oh, in let's another see that. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe I think Jeff, that's I think a brilliant just, idea, Chris. Yeah. Just while we're, while we're looking at two pieces of really beautiful and important historical footage that really sort of set the stage and the tone, if I may use that yeah. Uh, I think it's um Take it's great it to put the piece in a pair. So just a couple minutes, but um yeah, let's Good. walk over all the. This is here. a treat to see into your archives, Jeff, and to yeah. 
how this video. Well, I will. Do. I'll say the Yeni piece is a fairly new one to me. It's a twenty-minute um, piece that came up because some um, Norwegian and Swedish filmmakers came to interview me a year or two ago. They asked me if I had anything, and I said, "Yeah, I've got these films, but you know they've already been released." But blah blah blah. Went down into my basement, pulled out a reel of film, sixteen millimeter film. Looked at what was written in marker on the outside, and said, "The vibrating world? What is this?" Uh -huh. I guess we'll that see. I know this was a totally different program than I thought. I thought I'd already converted this into DVD. This was a new film, which they used a part of, converted it to DVD, and then sent me back the DVD so I could then make it popular. So this one is Hans Jenny. The one after him is Hans Jenny's son-in-law, who actually lost his place to live because it became a cymatic studio. His bedroom <laughs> became a cymatic studio. So we'll, we'll, okay. here we go. We're going to show the, this first clip, and then we'll follow with the shooting one. And there will be a marked difference in quality. Instead of the square steel plate, we take a round one and sift quartz sand onto it. Reacting to the wave trains caused by the torn, the exciting crystal sets the plate vibrating. As we hear the note, we see the sonorous figure which goes with this note. Our technique of vibrating crystals enables us to proceed from one note to another in one continuous experiment. The change in the sonorous figures is due to the change in the note. The higher the note, the more delicate the pattern. We use plates of various shapes. Here we take a triangular plate, again with the crystal attached to the underside, and see the resulting sonorous figure. We proceed to higher and higher notes and see the more complicated and delicate figures. Chris, can you pause it for a second? Yep. So just, uh, this just occurred to me, this is the first time I've ever seen these composited like this. And um, that person who was assisting Yenny in that film in the early 60s yeah. was Christian Stuten. You'll see him now, Quite a number of years later, probably 30 years later, and I filmed him in Switzerland at the Hurika exhibition in Zurich um, using Yeni's original. This happened to be the original tonoscope, the original acoustic tonoscope. He'll describe it. But I also then later in this program, you may get to see some of Yeni's composite material that he put together to create a projector of uh, vibrating water. So you could project and see the form of the oscillating water on a screen. But this first one will be the, what we call the blow scope. He's not blowing into it, he's singing into it. So mm -hmm. it's the pitch of the tone that's creating this. Take it away, boss. This is our tonoscope with which you can make the human voice visible. You sing it, into it here, and the air passes through there, comes out here, and then you put different frames on it. Here, a six-sided figure. Then you take a natural rubber membrane, put into a frame, place it on here. Then, in this case, we use as indicator for the vibrations sand. And screw it lightly onto here. And now I'm going to sing into it. So everything is specific. If you have the same frequency and the same tension and the same indicator, you always get the same form. The higher the tone, the more complicated the form. So I could comment on that, or we could keep going. Well, make a comment. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. So there were a few things that affected the shape of the pattern. Do you remember what they might be? 
the higher the note, the more complex the tone. The, 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 that is certainly one of them. Yes. If yeah. you see a really intricate figure, chances are it's a high pitched frequency. Right. I would say also the shape of the container, the shape of the petri dish affects yeah, that, the edges. In, in that case, it was the case of the Octagon. of the structure that is holding the res the uh, the resonating. Yeah, I would also say the medium it. has to affect it somewhat. Yes, the medium, the material that's resonating is going to affect it. As Even well, things the like indicator. the temperature. You know, yeah, how, the how spherical ah, is definitely. the little grains of whatever it is. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and again, on that membrane that was vibrating, remember he said as you push it, you're changing the tautness. Oh, right. It makes it more responsive. If you if you get it more taut, it's going to be much more responsive to lesser vibrations. Right. So you'll get more intricate patterns when the when the medium is when the uh, in, when the Excellent. panel the rubber membrane is taut then you will if it's not if it's not it's just going to be more blobby it's more mm -hmm. less defined get more energy to move it around yeah yes I think we just get also just got to acknowledge that for the first time there's many people seeing this for the first time what an incredible representation of geometry that comes through sound and then it's showing some of the very mechanics of universal structure i mean it's, it's bringing forth something so significant in, in terms of the way that it displays it. I know we have Tony, who's a physicist in the audience, but I'm not a physicist, but there's something uh, so amazing about the fact that we can make, make this visible, whether why it's through cells, water or through sand. Forms, or, why are life forms, why are, why are why, these forms yeah, yeah, yeah. the way they what are? What an interconnected- uh, Something to do with the patterns of nature inherent mm -hmm. to the laws of reality, right. the laws of physics, yeah. Well, I just want to put a bookmark in that one yeah. because towards what I hope will be the end of our presentation, which is the closing comments. Okay. Actually, it's the launch between the end of book two and, and going to the commentaries. So it was my transition piece. Okay. As I mentioned, this book, the core is volume one and two, but there's a whole 20 pages in front of that helping you to integrate into that book and the density of Yeni's writing. So you're not just hit with a wall of text that many of the pieces you don't understand right off the bat. I, I just want to mention uh, one of your missions, Jeff, I know personally, has been to help people understand the full depth and breadth of this work. Because the pictures alone are mesmerizing. You can gain a lot from the pictures. But you're saying that we really, you really want people to dive into the text and have more accessibility, uh, make it more user-friendly. Because as you pointed mm. out, it's pretty dense stuff to understand it. And well, um, over the 40 years that I've been selling these books, since 01 to whatever it is now, 22, but I was selling the original books before that, you know, 10 yeah. years from importing them from Switzerland. Um, I've found that most people buy the book because someone um, suggests it, recommends it to them. They look at the pictures and the book sits on the shelf. And that, I'm not critiquing that because I wrote a publisher's confession in 2001, when I put those two books together, saying if I hadn't had to put those composite books, if I had, if I hadn't had to composite them, right. I would never have read the books. Mm. Yourself, Looking at yeah. the pictures, reading a few captions, diving into a chapter here and there, it's a right. perfectly acceptable way to try and digest the book little bit by little bit. I've got to say though, watching some of the videos first, and reading some of these essays that explain it and explain why it's not easy to understand and how to make it more relatable makes a big difference in how much you're gonna understand of it. And I'm really hoping we put a lot of time, like three years, an extra two years from when we were just about ready to launch it. And an in, inordinate amount of time and money, let's put it that way, mm -hmm. into making this book much more Accessible. Osmotic. So you weren't up against it. It was compelling you to move into higher levels of understanding. Yeah. That was the mission of this book, is after publishing it for so many years, gotcha. extorting people by not uh, by yeah. mercenarily taking their money without them even understanding what it was they were getting into. I've tried to repent and rectify that and turn it into 
an actual something that's going to be useful for people. And not to say that wasn't, but now that my consciousness has continued to unfold and I get to see how this looks like the Parisha and the Prakriti energies in the esoteric Eastern philosophies, I can work at that level of metaphor where I couldn't do back in 01 because those things weren't even familiar to me then. So there's a lot of what I call, well, I guess you could call it a lot of things, but it's a living metaphor. And um, it, it's a parable things. as well. You know, you can explain metaphysical or people through metaphor as long as it's more relevant to your personal experience, tactile or visual or things like that, it right. gives you an access point to go into that. I want to so, hear from Chris what, how you digested somatics. Good point. Kind of good journey. point. And that, you really delved into it us. much yeah. deeper than most. Yeah. And also you're a visual artist. You're technically proficient. Like what has been your experience? Why are you so electrified by it, by your own admission? Well, I'm going to go back to a screen share and I'm going to do this a little out of order um, because I want to address something that you brought up, Laura Lee, before, which is, you know, what's what's going on in the world today? You know, what's what's happening um, that, that's sort of seemingly bringing some of this back alive or interest? And um, there are two really powerful things that struck me. And again, as noted, I, I've known Jeff for a long time. I've sort of witnessed cymatics on the periphery, saw some of the demos and, and I've always been intrigued. But then when the opportunity to look at the book in a fresh light happened, we um, we started to say, okay, like, yeah, like, obviously we want to do a, a reprinting here, but as Jeff has noted, how do you make it more accessible? Why? Well, one reason why is, I mean, this is just a snapshot of taken yesterday, actually, of the present most popular Facebook page about cymatics. 322,000 people are following this. Like, that's a, that's a substantial following. This is not a page we operate or control even really knew about. Um, but that is, you know, it's, you know one, one wonders in, in this moment in our time and our history, why is there this, you know, over a quarter million people checking this out or even over a quarter exactly. million light. Yeah. One of the things that struck me um, as well, we, we actually highlight this in the book from Ted Joya, who I, you know, we've talked about a little bit, I think, or mentioned um, as another I'm person. a fan of Ted Joya and his Substack. I read his yeah, news. Ted is amazing yeah. and, and has, is, has a wonderful contribution as a commentary in the, in the book um, and did share this on Twitter, aka X, I guess now, um, a number of, I guess it was a couple of years ago. Um, and I don't, it's probably a little hard to see, but there's 8.9 million views on this image, or not image, but it was a video of someone you know, doing a cymatics demonstration. And, and, you know, one wonders, you know, in this world where we're surrounded in AI and animation and what is real and what is not, yeah. it also calls up this wonderful quote from Jim Metzer, who is also a contributor in the book. And, and I just love this quote because it sort of does it all for me, which is cymatics is hard evidence of real magic. There's nothing behind the curtain here. <laughs> there really isn't. And, it, and I think that is what is so attractive to us as a culture and as an evolving species trying to grasp a, a, a very evolving uh, definition of what is real and what isn't real. Um, you know, what's fiction, what's fake, what's any of it. And so the uh, cymatics is undeniably real, despite the fact that there is this mystery surrounding how it all works, right? So I think that is where, when we talk about why we're excited about releasing the book, but also in the context of all the commentaries and the showcasing of who's also excited about this. Um, that I come back to that quote every time, because I do think the more distant and difficult it becomes to assess what a reality is. Um, and I, I love your insights too, Orly, about the 99% of you know, what we can and cannot perceive. Um, you know, it's probably only increasing in some ways, different, different ways, but uh, we really, we end up in this but very uh, moment of this. This is just nature. And right. could we see sound waves? They would just be second nature. Right. But they're magical because we can't see them yet. We feel their impact. So to make something visible that our senses alone cannot bring to us is magical. That right. is when you cross that magical mm -hmm. threshold, I think. 
and we can understand more of the reality around us. So that yeah. that aha experience is what's so delightful. So we did have um, just a few, you know, the, the book itself, as, as noted, um, you know, the other fun kind of factoid about this, as Jeff and I has mentioned, you know, we, we started working on this many years ago. And the part we haven't told you yet is right about two years ago, we were done. We, we were done. <laughs> <laughs> we, had, we were ready to reprint. We were ready to bring the book to press. Right. Like we've got it. We, you know, we actually, I have, I have Jeff's old computer next to me. We were able to find the old files, the original files, get them updated to, you know, over 20 years of software updates, believe it or not. We oh, wow. <laughs> resurrected. Um, the, the Finding original that copy. computer was like the Volkswagen scene in, uh, okay. what's his name? It's it's actually quite there is dirt on the bottom of this computer because it was being stored in Jeff's garage. And he's like, I think the book might be on here. I said, yes, thank, thank God it is. <laughs> it would have been a lot of work to, Maine. Yeah. To, to restat, you know, to, to rescan pages and everything. It was the original. Anyway, it worked out really well. But uh, <laughs> but it, we also the had dragon scene was in the it was Woody an archaeological Allen movie, dude. Right? Yeah. Right. But we also had a contributor who who came into the scene, Tessa, who has just been it was a wonderful member of this team. But she she basically read us the inconvenient truth of, guys, this is nice and it's Hans Danny's work, and we were excited about that, of course. But it's still difficult to approach. It's still you know what's happened since two thousand one. That's the meaty story. You know the the rest of this. People are as Jeff said. You'll put it on the shelf. You'll look at the pictures. You'll take it down again. Totally fine way to digest it. But how do we how do we get it more more enticing and engaging? And um, you know, I think Barb Crow, the quote here from Hans Wieni's work being instrumental to her development of a theory of music therapy is just one example of how people have brought this into their lives and into their careers and into their practice. Mm -hmm. It um, applies to so many fields, right? It really does. Because and, sound um, permeates everything. Yeah. So we have this. These are just snapshots from a cell sheet that we we have have developed. You know, just talking a little bit about you know the book, but. Wanted to also, you know, just talking, we keep saying these things and just to put some visual about the expanse of what is in here around those two volumes. As Jeff mentioned, there are all of these opener pieces that really help us, you know, contextualize cymatics for those who are about to, to read. Um, Christian Stuten, Billieu, Joya are all doing a wonderful job of centering us and, and giving us that, that, that view after the book. And even actually, it's actually even after the index of the book is when you also start to jump into the commentaries. It's very rare that you have a book that, the, wait, there's more, there's 50 more pages after the index. Um, <laughs> but as, as you mentioned, you know, really just a, 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 the cymatic star studded list of, of, you know, scientists and healers and uh, practitioners and artists who've been working with cymatics and in so many delightful Different applications and, yeah so mm -hmm. so really great stuff here and then we we do finish with trying to bring it really to the super present including exhibits and video work and things you know like the lord of the rings intro that uh was done with amazon um cymatics uh, science versus music a music video artist out of new zealand has made utilizing these techniques and shaped by water an exhibit by um uh, artists another actually australian or new zealand artist uh, along with Ivy Ross, who's going to be on your program next week. She can talk a little bit about this. Mm. Uh, you know, curated an entire exhibit in Milan around cymatics. Okay. Um, wow. And it's we've actually got some sh some shots of that. But so that's, if you want to know why I'm excited, <laughs> it's why it was not hard to draw me into this project. It's It's things like this all wrapped around that core, you know, from 67 and 74. And, you know, these two volumes that, that really sparked a lot of it. But I did want to also mention that part of what's wonderful about these commentaries is that they're not only drawing us to the future, but they are also acknowledging the to a past. past. And look at these two women who were yeah. like the first. I love that. Yes. That, yeah. You know, Yeni most definitely was, you know, the father of what we now think of as modern day cymatics, but it is so vital that we also recognize the history and John did a beautiful job of, of, of showing a, you know, a, a wide range and a big spectrum of how, how much contribution even preceded Yeni. And this mystery has been out there for a long time. It's not like cymatics started with Yeni. People were observing this phenomenon for centuries yeah. for all of humanity. But <laughs> I think it is, 
it is very important that we honor specifically these women who in a world of, let's say a patriarch, <laughs> um, that they really deserve outstanding um, acknowledgement of their contributions to the science as well. And, and making guess, that visible. I would guess also that nature has afforded us many, many opportunities to observe this from time immemorial because I'm a Seattleite and I was in my house during a rather big earthquake uh, in Seattle to the point where it felt like the wind was blowing through the house. It was shaking oh. so badly. So of course the, the wisdom is you step outside. Don't let the building fall down on you. Step outside. There's a pool outside, a small pool. Uh -huh. I wow. saw mandalic patterns that the earthquake was generating through the pool of water. And so there was nature creating her own cymatic demonstration for me. And I'm stopping and looking at the patterns and going, oh, wow, forgot about the earthquake. Um, <laughs> soon subsided. It wasn't, you know, it, it didn't bring buildings down, thankfully. But there it was enough to generate the, the Earth's vibrations mm -hmm. through a pool of water on the surface. That was fascinating. So, yeah. You should have jumped in the pool. <laughs> uh, it was shallow, shallow pool. Yeah. <laughs> Well, in that same intro um, that, that that John Reed takes us through, um, he actually you know, has cites a number of examples and, and even other experiments and work that he's done and others have done bringing cymatic imagery into, um, you know, other other mediums, other forms, how it how it imprints on even a human blood sample, um, mm -hmm. just with a a, a voice, mm -hmm. and it makes you know as we look at that and consider what is if that's happening inside us you know how 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 does music heal how does music affect and imp 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 and what is our fascination with those kaleidoscopes oh. you know those little tubes oh, that yeah. you turn and then all the colored panels fall mm -hmm. into place and it's mesmerizing to the eyes yeah. but maybe we're just so geared to a remembering of our own core uh yeah origin kind of thing yeah yeah. And the um, yeah the the additionally I, my worlds collided in this as well. I actually I I w worked on this display in Times Square. I used to be an executive producer of video for large scale digital out of home advertising. <laughs> so this was like really wait, wait I, that's familiar. But um, cymatic imagery was used by the the Times Square Arts Council at one point to uh, showcase. See, it gets um, everywhere. Exactly, a very expanse, but but thinking again, all of these opportunities, I don't even want to call this cymatics in the pop culture. It's cymatics mm -hmm. moved forward to today um, mm -hmm. in so many different ways and capturing our fascination. Again, back to that hard evidence of magic. That's yeah. so- Yeah, this was a, a strictly mercenary portrayal here. Um, they were, you know, up there, the Arts Council did it, but, you know, it was, Chris didn't even know about this until he looked at it and said, oh, I was involved in that. Yeah. <laughs> huh. And so something that that articulate, I mean, is that truly a semantics image? Oh, or yes. Is that, you know, some other kind of input to get that kind of intricacy? Because we weren't seeing that in Yenny's demonstration. So how do you get something that intricate? Well, I well, think that's really where in, in terms of the technology between Yenny's work back in the 60s and early 70s. I mean, we're talking 50 years. This is all sound wave generated. Oh, yeah. yeah, right here. Yes. And so when we start to look, and, and this is where, uh, not surprisingly, our, the artists are pushing the boundaries um, mm -hmm. and, and really showing us just incredible complexity and beauty. And just, I mean, your, your breath is taken away. And consider, again, these are stills mm -hmm. that formed and manifested in the same way as that 16 millimeter film we just watched a few minutes ago. Mm -hmm. Imagine what that looks and feels like to then get this moment of snap and to... playing with all those various parameters from right. tension to shape to tone to medium yeah. and on and it's on. light it's material it's water it's liquid it's mm -hmm. not liquid that what's exactly. what it's not is computer generated art this <laughs> is real and not to say that that's not real but back to the tangibility um, Let's give reality credit where credit is due. Right. <laughs> in our day and age, yeah. Um, but even in artists like uh, Rachel Linton, so uh, uh, Jake, sorry, Jacob Adlington is also featured in the book um, in, in those commentaries, as is uh, Rachel Linton talking about her journey with cymatics and art. And you can see, I mean, these are actually physical mm -hmm. um, resin uh, 
sculptures essentially mm -hmm. uh and painting included but that you can see those patterns and some of that cymatic um rippling very similar to what i think you experienced on the pool <laughs> laura mm -hmm. um, just using that vibration which you can actually see manifest in her work um, i talked to rachel she sets up really wonderful little demos at art yes. games for children to come and play with i i think that makes it so accessible yeah so. um that music video i was speaking of earlier um this is actually worth googling we did not include uh to, to play this but if you look up nigel stanford and cymatics and science versus music wonderful uh and really evocative experience um again no special effects being used just media and film um, to capture these incredible cymatic uh, experiences with flame water sand and um but, but it's it, <laughs> we were like this is probably copywritten and we want to make sure that you know youtube is getting <laughs> all the credit where credit is due we don't want the program flagged for anything uh, actually speaking of credit where credit is due, Nigel contacted me to license the um, voiceover, the initial voiceover yes. for this program. And he and his co-producer are both uh, MTV producers, or were at the time. I don't know, they're, they're maybe back down in Australia now. So this piece is the hippest portrayal of cymatics I've ever seen. It's really <laughs> a wowsy kind of show. It's and it's club. not short, it's, it's a number of minutes long, so. Yeah. Club music. <laughs> and I noticed this is in the medium of water. So water has to be one of the best mediums to or fluid to to demonstrate this, doesn't it? You're just you're just like leading me right into these beautiful examples of this. <laughs> um, <laughs> so shaped by water is mentioned again, Ivy Ross on your program next week. Mm. This is the exhibit. Um, definitely have her just describe this this journey for you. But um, you know, working with Lachlan Turkson, um, as the artist, just doing beautiful things with reflective bowls of water, experiencing resonance. They did they did a lot with shining light into that experience, to, so the light would bounce on the ceilings. Um, so you would get these incredible patterns of everything in motion. This is again uh, shaped by water can be viewed by googling just that exhibit name. There's um, some really great video clips of. Well, I'm also intrigued by her beautiful stands, right? To yes. contain the water and make yeah. it shallow. It works really well in shallow water. And just, just really, really remarkable. Um, so it's a film, right? Right. Okay. Wanting to, to, I mean, just this, this one was just sort of blew all of our minds because nobody, none of us knew this was happening. <laughs> that there was a studio uh, that called Plains of Yonder that decided to use this, uh, you know, cymatic imagery for the opener for the new Rings of Power. Uh, Lord of the Rings uh, show that they developed on Amazon for Amazon Prime. Yeah, um, the opening credit roll is all real cymatics, except for one point where you see this beautiful S shape coming into script around the title right. that is obviously computer generated. And it's it's so obvious because the organicness of the actual cymatic form is much more enticing than something that's so regular and going into something that's so familiar. But if you think but even it works like, great, it works great as a yeah. as a as a character generator. But just to see the distinction there. Gotcha. Sorry, Chris, go on. No, I was just gonna say, I just I loved the metaphor that that they recognize the studio recognize. In fact, we have a quote from them in the book because um, we did interview them and, and pull some some media forward. Is just that recognition that. It is powerful, you know. Here's this this talk of you know this medieval sort of allegory story of um, you know Lord of the Rings and how you know it, it is all about these sort of mysterious powers and influences. <laughs> what better imagery to use for the opener than cymatics? Yeah. I mean, truthfully, it's it's genius. So and this world, this land where things were sung into shape. Yes. You know, there you go. Yeah. Well, among my first interviews on cymatic that followed. Uh, on the heels of our first interview, Jeff, was with David Elkington and John Stewart. I recall that, yeah, yeah. And they were talking about looking at patterns emerging and, and being sensed by the people of the medieval days that became part of the iconography on the churches and their, their motifs and their decorative imagery. And mm. the question, how did they suss those out? How did they grok those to start to put them into the patterns? Because so Laura what we Lee, were seeing was the, the somatics patterns looked so identifiable to 
the the various rosettes, the motifs, the various iconography. Yeah. At the very end of volume two in the second book, Yenny goes into that, talking about how people like Soc um, Socrates, Pythagoras, um, Archytas, Direct. Timaeus, that was yeah. written about all this. They perceived in a very different way than people do nowadays. We've gotten taken over, you know, the uh, the dominance of the corporeal mind. Um, the things that are material and that are pragmatic and that can be manipulated for an intent changes the way, or let's say focusing on that, changes the way you perceive the world because you no longer are merging into the vibrational pattern of the matrix you're yeah. observing from afar as an interloper and a mercenary who wants to come in there rape pillage and whatever and get out with the goods mm -hmm. so it's a totally different sense of what you're opening up to if you open up to the the aspect of the creative principle it's always changing it's always dissolving it's always reintegrating it gives you a sense of your own mortality and immortality. Yeah. So it's a very, very different a personal aspect of perspective. interest in your work directly relates to our work and some of the visionary experiences we have. And mm -hmm. it was just yesterday that my experience included here I am, you know, being at one with the universe and feeling a column of light come up from earth to the heavens and seeing many, many, many columns of lights and patterns and feeling the winds of the cosmos come and pluck the strings just by the passage of the winds mm -hmm. and sound off into the music of the spheres mm -hmm. and looking around at the patterns, looking around and seeing these kind of pattern, understanding how we are columns of light being turned and spun by the earth as we revolve around the sun and what are patterns that we're making in the cosmos as little points of light and seeing it as a whole and hearing it vibrated, hearing it sung, hearing it become the symphony of the cosmos. You know, these are the kind of experiences. So yeah, we relate perfectly with yeah. direct experience to cymatics. We understand cymatics as such a beautiful illustration a, right. that we are all part of this field, the yeah. sea. The cosmos is a sea of this. It is one Petri dish. It is one, one harmony. And we're all sounding. So yes, we have personal experience of just what you're saying so yeah we love your work yeah. <laughs> we love your work i was going to use i was going to use that that as another great segue to thinking about you know taking a bit of a step away from the art commentaries and and really looking at some of what you're you know kind of again speaking about with cymatics and use and intent yes um, and and just how important it is to sort of still recognize that and as as actually a validation for some of those those things you feel you know that where is that yeah. coming from is it the resonance of our world is it you know and is maybe the showing that, herself to us and and in all of her display right right mm -hmm. but that it's it, the those feelings and the way that sound works works on us is is very real and is being studied and you have scientists like Mandara Cromwell who are really opening that up and continuing to explore that with devices um and Jeff, I don't know if you wanted to talk a little bit about the AMI and, and some of Mandara's work, but just how, you know, this really has shown, um, you know, true changes in our, in our own physiology as we. And how it can be applied to healing. So please, from please the mechanical do. Or the inner technology level. Yeah. Tell, tell us a little bit more about the AMI so that we understand what, what exactly we're looking at. Okay. What we're looking at is the thermograph. Uh, it is two different shots of measuring heat which measures the amount of circulation in the body. So the one on the left, you can see there's large areas of stagnation with the orange. Whereas on the right, you see there's much more green and blue, which means the temperature is quite a bit different. Mm -hmm. So it's much actually lower. less, the, the higher you get, the more inflammation there is. So this was a way of, of dissipating the inflammation, opening up the capillaries and getting blood flow through there. Wow. And that was after a treatment where you see on, on the side there where there are the two gel pads and the, and the dial up uh, punch phone thing in the middle. Yes. That's how you would 
program your little unit to send certain frequency configurations into the gel pad, put your feet on top of the gel pad, and it goes right into the meridians. Mm. So it's a very effective way to reduce inflammation and a number of other commutations, they're called frequency overlays, would have a, a wide range of effects. So um, interesting. Well, this goes back to the very organic idea of earthing of people that like to take their shoes off absolutely. and walk on the planet. It's the same thing, isn't it? Just getting back to the original earthing. idea. Yeah. Earthing before the AMI. Our feet was... are receptor sites for yeah. energy when wow. we walk on the earth with well, the ground. Yeah. yeah. Good yeah. point. Again, I can't I can't express enough the, the amazing thing. I mean, Madara has about eight pages of commentary <laughs> um, talk, walking her journey of discovery of cymatics through through the book, through Yeni's book, being introduced oh. via that, and then all of the connections made with John Reed and others uh, that have sure. led her to a whole career and exploration mm. of, of devices and, and, and science and healing. Um, just to, I, I think this might be a good uh, opportunity to maybe finish Jeff with the Lauterwasser conversation and, and maybe a little bit, one more video um, that would be a, kind of a good capstone before we start some, some conversation or additional conversation. Because I know sure, we let's do that. that. Yep. Like one hour, <laughs> we're a little bit over that, but uh, that's fine. Yeah, well, Alex, no uh, sorry, louder boss, or it's Kellerman, actually. Sorry, yeah, I was wondering what you were referring to. Yeah, yeah this would like be a wonderful boss. thing. No. Yeah, um, so Jeff had encountered Gabriel Kellerman. Maybe talk a little bit about your how you met and and caught in touch with him. Well, um, I met Gabriel Kellerman at the first World Congress on Climatic in Germany in 2014. He was one of the presenters there. Uh, he got into cymatics without even being exposed to Hans Jenny. Wow. The only person I know <laughs> that's the case of. But as you can tell, he got into it through his imagination and showing, especially on the left side, the different types of vortexual form. He's written a book on the archetype of the spiral vortex. So the two aspects of the motive and the generative of the spiral that can bring usually if it's creating a vortex it's bringing it in it's pulling inward whereas centripetal force would thrust it outward so you can see he is an artist uh chris were you planning on showing the piece yes yeah just so there's a three minute trailer for video that that jeff produced um a number of years ago not that long ago actually just about Five, six years ago, perhaps? Um, it was produced in 15. Okay, and then so I brought Gabrielle over to uh, our what I call our cymatic conference. Mandara and I co-produced the conferences for many years. She produced them, but I I uh, stocked the pond with people like Gabriel Kellerman and uh, Howard Levy, the harmonica player. And I got to moderate between the two of them. Wow. Levy is the harmonica <laughs> player for Bela Fleck and the Flecktones, amongst many, many other he's an amazing musician. So to have the musician's point of view against the artist's point of view, and Kellerman is also a very in-depth scientist. I was gonna say eloquent, but he was not eloquent because he was trying to speak English. <laughs> <laughs> but eloquent still, in German. You, know, you can see it in his work. It's just yeah. tremendous. So we'll show, we'll show this video, it's about three minutes, but it also, sure. um, yeah. I just want just... everybody to sort of keep in mind the, where we started with the imagery from again back to the 16 millimeter film and and be just, ready. Yeah, yeah, just before you start that film, I wanted to mention the the Kellerman artistry on the left. I love the idea of taking somatics from the flat surface uh, ge geometric shapes we always Make assume, and all of a sudden, yeah, bring, making it 3D and giving bringing life to it. That is another whole way of of representation. I love that. Well, well you know, if we showed the whole part of this video. It, it has Kellerman talking about, I use this spherical resonating chamber. Mm. He's the only person I know who does that. Yeah. Creates a resonating chamber within which he builds three-dimensional cymatic images. Mm. And he uses very viscous materials too. So he makes a lot of three-dimensional. I don't know where the three-minute cut point is. So it's, it's right, it's right at that. That sweet spot. So you'll get to see some of it. <laughs> okay, Chris, good. Chris has got it under control. Oh, we're so ready. All right. <laughs> so one more video, and then we'll uh, yeah, then we'll get into some conversation. But uh, we go. I go. You know what? Let me just double check and make sure I'm sharing sound. I want to make sure that's all.
All good. Yep, it is. Okay, here we go. Thank you. Back in the 1950s, Hans Jenny was able to spread powder on a steel plate and animate that powder using sound frequencies, getting it to rise off the plate and configure itself in beautiful geometric patterns just from the influence of those sound frequencies. That was really the basis of cymatics. Cymatics is a study of wave phenomena and vibration, so it's a branch of physics. Physics is really good about expressing the mechanics of force and matter and how they interact and what to expect. You throw a ball up in the air, it's going to come down. But science has never been able to even approach how the unmanifest comes into manifestation. The beauty of cymatics is it shows that the only way physical form makes sense is through some higher quality vibration animating it. I've been publishing cymatics for the better part of 30 years. I've published the works of Han Jenny, who coined the term cymatics. I've published the work of Lauterwasser. I've been exposed to many other people in the field. The work of Gabriel Kellerman is different because he is an artist. And as an artist, he has approached the science as an art form. When I was uh, young, I have a um, microscope from my grandma. I put my microscope with a speaker and I put a white talc powder. And I uh, put the sound inside, continuous sound, and I observe uh, appear some very interesting worms. And I drawing what happened in microscope. For me, it was uh, fascinating. And also was the, the beginning. Kellerman shows how nature actually responds to invisible forces. He works with a sense of beauty and adoration of nature. And that comes through his work, so it's inspired. It's just fabulous. It's brilliant, it's beautiful, and it is breathtaking. The cymatic principle is very easy to see. I work with a special device with a spherical resonant cavity, and I work with the one oscillator, with one single wave, and I, I obtain a structure pentagonal. After a few days in my lab, I was surprised. I appeared the, the human face. <laughs> That's usually everyone's reaction is. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> we took that to that shut us so all good. up, right? Yeah. Goodness. We could start with some of the really interesting comments as we have people raise their hand for their live comments. Well, I know that Tony had the opportunity to spend time with Jeff uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, we, yeah. all, we all met at the Institute and had discussions and Tony's been making yeah. comments throughout the day today. Tony, would you like to jump on and make a comment now and uh, add your observations and questions? Well, well certainly. Um, Jeff, it's wonderful seeing you. You may remember I got this book. Uh, oh, I didn't remember that. Yeah, great, great. Uh, so, so uh, there, there's, and I'll try not to ask too many of them, but immediately my mind went to, to what is a pure sound? There's always a bandwidth. And then what happens if we add two, uh, two uh, frequencies together mm -hmm. that are separate? Uh, what then happens? And uh, also questions of the sharpness of the structure. This may depend on a number of things, including the purity of the sound, I think Laura said the the uh, thinness of the of the water, and maybe that reduces to viscosity or other other things too, or or tension on the drum skin. It's um, the idea of combinations immediately rather than monochromatically looking at this immediately appealed, and I wonder if you'd comment on that. Well, first of all, someone did a much better job on commenting than I will. It was Hans Jenny. He used um, he showed the difference between single frequencies and multiple frequencies. Uh, in one of the latter chapters of, I think it was book two, um, he was talking specifically, well, he was also used an oscilloscope, which is not, you know, it's not 
uh, particularly cymatic is you're using a, an interpretive device, the oscilloscope, than actual physical matter taking the shapes for you. But he showed what happened with one frequency using sine waves and then multiple sine waves and um, how they amplified each other, but they interpenetrated each other certain particular ways, depending on a number of other factors, amplitude being the, the predominant one, how close they were together in frequency. Um, the if it was different types of material, um, obviously not in the oscilloscope, but um, so there were many, many different parameters that he experimented with over the years. Okay. And of course, the thought of what would happen with electronic dance music or club music, uh, if this could be something <laughs> on. What Actually, you could see that in the, uh, in the, the, you the video. You become a granule hopping around, right? Yeah. You could see that in the uh, cymatics versus music video, because those guys were MTV people, and they did use some dance music in there. Um, and some stuff where he was hitting a keyboard very specifically, and you could see the response to it. But um, basically, the, the parameters are dance music or hip hop or stuff like that that has a lot of pulsation, a lot of drive, is really, really good for generating a certain type of pattern. Um, it's called the explosive pattern, where the lycopodium powder goes all over the room. But um, you know, if you modulate it a little bit, you keep the amplitude down, the pulsation is going to, well, why, why did I move that from here? Because it had the perfect thing. Oh, this is a pulsation. Yes. This is one of Lauterwasser images from water sound images. And it explicitly, it almost looks like fireworks. But if you can see, it almost looks like a seed of a dandelion or something. Yeah. It is a percussive blast of sound coming out of this core and uh, not exploding. just making little explosion marks, but it's actually creating structures that are still interacting with one another. It's not just like an explosion driving particles outward. They're being sustained by the pressure waves around it. Wow. I, I wonder- uh, if, if Okay, there... there's even further invisible forces that we're not able to see that are interacting. And... That's right. Physical right. forces, in, yeah, lots of dynamics. Okay. Mm -hmm. We wow. know the impact of music, particularly repetitive music that's rhythmic. Um, and I'm just wondering if there would not be metrics that could come out uh, from the pattern forms for where this is going to be really good music without even listening to it. Huh. Like oh. it. And, and then uh, I, wow. my mind uh, drifting to all sorts of wonderful things uh, here. And you know, I'm thinking back to uh, to uh, a Philip Glass uh, piece called Music in Changing Parts. It was uh -huh. one of the early pieces, and it has added the rhythms that come yep. in, the phase in and out, and it's extremely powerful. I'm, I just started wondering what's going to happen then, mm. and then I started wondering about about the universe and all the things that are coming. We know we're, we're receiving gravity waves; they're very low level, but but they're coming through us. We have, we're now in the age of multi-messenger astronomy. We're not just uh, electrodynamics. Uh, we're, we're not, you know, we have several ways of information from other parts of the universe. Mm. And um, th this is um, becoming very big and very important, but we know these subtle things are happening uh, to us, uh, coming from the universe through us. Yeah. And then my mind jumped to, and I think you alluded to it, to complexity theory, and and these patterns uh, come out of some level of order, and there's great scientific inquiry now into into the nature of complexity. I would think this would be a fertile area to uh, to expand on. You, know, you would love Barbara Crow's work, music and soul making. Um, she's the one who mentioned uh, being uh, exposed to Hans Jenny's work opened her up as a music therapist. She's a uh, graduate, she's now emeritus at Arizona State University, but she taught graduate music therapy for many, many years. And it said, seeing this book in 2001 um, helped open her eyes to complexity science and how it interfered, how inter it uh, co-created in her consciousness, the uh, music therapy. It was very um, 
what's the word she was, it was very um it sort of showed her mm -hmm. a direction to to inquire and to pursue and reflected right back on Yanni's work so yeah. i would definitely going to talk to her yeah 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 so she's therapy. at uh, she's in tempe so she's not far from you yeah yeah very cool Perfect. Well, that would be fascinating as i know there's a lot of puzzling again about complexity theory yeah and, uh, you know i had a nobel prize winner visiting and he was spending time up at the santa fe institute uh, uh -huh. and the subject was complexity theory yeah and I asked him, his name is john mather i asked him what uh what have you found out? What do we know about it? And the, is there a good book? And the answer is no. <laughs> so it's hard to contain I'm, it all, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. yeah so he'll, he'll actually be at my house again this, this coming week. I've invited him to the university. And I'm going to ask him uh, about cyanetics and complexity theory. And Great. He'll, look at me, he'll look at me and say, what? And, and, <laughs> and then, uh, you know, I, maybe I should order order Barbara's book and see if I can get it before he comes. Yeah, yeah actually, um, she doesn't sell it. Um, she's retired, but her publisher would definitely have a a copy of it. Maybe um, yeah. I could. Well, thank you. We can we can sort that out. Yeah. So. Yeah. To be continued. Thanks, to, I know Tony. You could we could have the rest of the time with your questions because you're the <laughs> physicist. He has, yeah, insights that we don't have. So that Tony's bringing up, there's so many more yeah. waves that are in this field. Some will never get our handles. That will never understand or never detect. Oh, no, don't 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 say yeah. never. Or, uh, That's what I was thinking. But who are you but, speaking so, for, white lady? <laughs> yeah. Everything we discover, we discover that there are yet further things. We exactly. Our, our, our we never get to the end of the game. Oh, it's yeah. actually a blessing, right? Yeah. There's always more to see, more to go. Yeah. The journey continues. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Good and, point. Okay, and actually, again. Gary yeah. Hawkins is another old pal. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, this is old home week. Um, and yeah. he says he's got an answer. Gary does some really interesting work. Uh, it was a Tesla coil that he demonstrated to us on our very first meeting with Gary. Yeah, no, uh, no, long ago. 1990s. That he built. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Gary, hey, knows, Gary. Gary knows a little bit about RFC. waves. Hi, you're gonna, Gary. You're going to keep your video off and just use mic? Yeah, because I don't know who the old guy in the mirror is, and I have myself yes. like 35 years old, and, <laughs> uh, and it, okay. uh, hi, Jeff and uh, Christopher. Uh, my experience to address Tony's question, uh, what happens when you add more frequencies was in the 90s. I've gotten so sidetracked into software, but um, so I had about a 10 inch uh, speaker uh, pointed up with a uh, latex stretched across it and a perimeter around the outside. And then it just sprinkled some sand on there from the beach. And I piped in a uh, frequency, you know, uh, adjusted the frequencies and saw the cymatics patterns. And then I grabbed another, another tone generator. And I simply uh, mixed them by connecting the wires together. So, so let's say we have like middle C around what 256, and then uh, a higher frequency around a thousand hertz or something. The higher frequency is going to ride along on the slower frequency. So, if you look at it on an oscilloscope, the you'll have a sine wave, the lower frequency, and it'll be wiggling at the higher frequency rate, mm -hmm. and something really strange happened so so the sand arranged and i think that some people are going to have find this hard to believe into what appeared sort of like a little solar system you had a sent a puddle of uh, sand in the in the middle like central sun and then you had these other uh pockets of sand around the outside like planets and they were all kind of rotating around the center a little bit and then there were these like streamers of sand that were going from one uh planet quote unquote to another yeah hey gary in that kellerman film the very beginning where the title came up to illustrate the universe yeah. Did you mm -hmm. see those spanish those planets spinning off one after another in this sort of arc I noticed that. 
Yeah. I missed it. I missed it. So uh -huh. it's very yeah. similar to what you were describing. But actually, Gary, it's not surprising that the universe would create over and over again in a set range of patterns because that's just resonance. How all the molecules, all the sound waves, all the physics, all the subtle energies want to coalesce and, and behave, the dynamics and of it. So actually, it's it's very much the redundancy is very reassuring and beautiful. And um, as above, so below, you know, from the implicate to the explicate, from from right. the from the macro to the micro, right, it's all one yeah. one pattern, right? Yeah. One creation. And so so it makes the, kind of the perfect the, sense. The question right, right the yeah. question arises is that how our solar system operates are there frequencies that exactly. are so well we haven't even thought to look for them well the sun has a, a frequency yeah. of 11 a cycle of 11 years and it has others that are slower yeah. and do those affect the way our solar system uh behaves now i didn't think I, right it's not a, i got distracted okay i'm going to be really candid what happened is there was this it was pretty loud. I had a seizure is what happened. And that kind of derailed the project. Um, oh. But um, uh, I didn't get around to adding a third frequency. Now, what would happen if you added a third? Would you have little moons going around those little planets, maybe? <laughs> Either that or you'd have another massive seizure. So you better check <laughs> yeah. somebody, somebody try this because I'm unfortunately too stuck in the software world right now. Tony, go ahead. Yeah, so uh, again, uh, I'm just wondering, you mentioned two frequencies, uh, 256 and 1,000. And and I'm sure you experimented with different frequencies, and and did you have to do a, a thousand experiments to find the solar system? Or did, <laughs> yeah, did yeah, 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 yeah. No, it required a lot of a lot of patience. So I was I had a, a one hand on each uh, tone generator uh, dial, and I would uh, uh, slowly move one, and then slowly move another, and eventually I got to a combination that would be. And it wouldn't have done any good if I had written down those frequencies for that particular solar system because it all has to do with the 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 mast of the uh, uh, speaker okay. and all the materials involved and everything. It's 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 very... totally unique to whatever configuration or whatever constellation right. of materials you're using. You but know? what yeah. I wanted to do is get this into a, a plexiglass uh, sphere with the sound coming from the center mm -hmm. onto the space shuttle as an experiment and <laughs> find out in zero g do you get a little uh with sand floating inside there do you get a solar system out of it but oh, i have okay. to say you're talking to the right guy because tony's helping to master the next generation of space experiments so <laughs> maybe he can put in a good word on this one and and they want more art in nasa yeah. i'm told so so forgive me because i'm gonna i'm gonna spiral off into glory land here so so somebody out there do this experiment and get it on video because we weren't doing video back then and um and and with these streamers that are going from one of these little planets to another uh, get that on video and then send it off to Mr. Musk and say, there you go, Yvonne, the fastest <laughs> trip from Earth to Mars. <laughs> Think of all the fuel you'll save. It's an arc because these streamers were an arc shape. Yeah. That makes sense. That makes Can we, sense. Should we yeah. call it a worm, wormhole? It's like a river, right? And if you're running your boat down the river, it uh, you're you're. Uh, can can you catch the wave that already exists that might propel yeah. you forward? Mm. And then he'll. You know, you it. might be really interested in Kellerman's book about the vortex spiral archetype, because wow. that would be directly <laughs> applicable. Mm. Go ahead, Tony. Oh wow! Okay. Like it's I, I have no idea that. what edition they're on at this point. Well, I had copies of the first edition that were put out. And yeah. I got word from someone else that those are long gone, which is not surprising because I sold a bunch of them. Um, he, but he has updated it periodically, and yeah. you know the old editions are history, and what he's working on now is the new edition. So, help us reach out to him and get him on here, and we can start asking those questions yeah. and view and yeah. contributors. I think it was just and his name is really easy. Need you to yeah, go ahead. His name is really December easy to remember. It's and basically Hell M N. L M N, right? K L M N. Those are the the progression of letters in the alphabet. 
okay. separated by E E E. Telemen. Ah. Telemen. Okay. A L M N. E. All right. That's how you can find his name. One more thing. Oh, yeah, may... there... <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. All right. uh, the new scientist came out with an article, December twenty eighth, I think saying that uh, our cells in the body oscillate and that yep. it's 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 in the audio range or a little above and that this was long suspected but they finally have have verified it uh, i knew so it we're the singing the music who's, who's of the spheres the i knew yeah. it that's yeah, yeah. That's who was the they who you're referring yeah. to who was doing this work New scientists, new scientists and a group of scientists that's been featured in. We'll have to well, look it up. The magazine, new new yeah. scientists. He's not referring to. Yeah, I'll yeah. drop a link yeah. into the chat. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Gary. Put some stuff in chat so we can follow up with your. Uh, and Tony wants to add to the conversation. Go ahead, Tony. And just uh, one second. It looks like Chris put up Kellerman's contact information in the chat box. Okay. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Can you can you grab it? I got it all. Okay. All right, Tony, good, and then um, I want to hear from Chris. Okay. Yeah. okay. Yeah, go ahead. Well, I was going to comment that what you're talking about may have a great deal to do with the formation of initial structures in the universe. Hmm. And, and you know, there are certainly various impulses, and, and we're looking very much at what happens to create the distribution of matter as galaxies form and other things form, like solar systems and stuff like that. So uh, we may not be duplicating precisely the planetary system as we know now, but we may be able to use this sort of thinking to, to describe the dynamics that created the initial conditions that could evolve into the planetary systems. That, that totally makes sense because everything is always evolving and changing depending on a plethora of circumstances and influences. So that totally makes sense, Tony. Oh, they're even now is talking about how the moon and uh, earth collided and how that created right there are a lot of dynamics going mm -hmm. on in or the moon being spun out of the earth because of the alignment with planets including jupiter and saturn yeah a lot of gravitational vector created so can there. we do you have tabletop experiments to look at these dynamics that's exciting to better understand that <laughs> yeah Not i wouldn't like want to computers. mess with that much gravity yeah, yeah. <laughs> but thank you gary for that yeah. appreciate that I, I just mentioned on a side note uh, gary kind of led our mad scientists explorations <laughs> as part of our radio program yeah. in the 90s and one of the a things lot of they had Tesla well, one of the things that they did is that is that boeing used to have this thing it was a it was a, a surplus store and all of their extra gear and equipment would go into these great big huge warehouse I don't even know if they knew what they were selling. And so Gary would be going through and looking at- Gary, take us down yeah, the vacation. Yeah, it was like, yeah. They, they had to close it down because it was ridiculous that they were selling this stuff off and to the general public. But in, in the meantime, we were buying stuff. Gary was buying stuff. <laughs> yeah, those were good times. Plus there was a uh, company that was doing uh, laser and fusion research. They oh, went up, they had their uh, funding pulled by the government and by uh, Exxon or somebody at the same time. And so they had a sale and I picked up like world-class uh, high voltage equipment. Um, <laughs> for, for a secret mass scientist high voltage lab, yeah. 100,000 volt power supply and a 55 gallon barrel. Oh, you're dangerous. Oh, uh, amazing stuff. So but that, I, I want to say, you mentioned you had a seizure. Do you think that had any? Yeah, I was thinking the same thing. But I was fields just that you're <laughs> generating for your mad we'll lab? We'll never know. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, Stay alive, Gary. Yeah, <laughs> Christopher, <laughs> do you, you want to weigh in on any of this? I'd like to hear your comments. Thank you, Christopher. Thank you. Get, thank you, Tony. Yeah, did you get you done? Yeah. Okay. And anybody else wants to raise their hand, they're welcome to. And Christopher, comments? Well, yeah, just I, I just wanted to uh, actually respond. It, it's like you're you're in our head. Uh, Shoshana had left in the in the in the um, chat. Was, do we have a website? And actually, we do. <laughs> and actually, in fact, Jeff has had a website for for decades. Um, and Jeff has been so gracious in letting me rework to that. Demolish the old to rebirth the new. <laughs> yes, it has been an illustrious <laughs> twenty years with yeah. with Mac. Yeah, publishing um but as jeff had noted you know there's a lot of products that jeff used to sell that doesn't sell anymore and it's like hey we have this great opportunity again with cymatics the new book coming out but also the consolidation of you know some of the other books and media 
um, to, to bring this forward back into um, a way that people can maybe more readily access and purchase your books um, specifically. Um, in fact, actually, if you don't mind, let me just share the screen real quick. Um, da, 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 there we go. Um, so there, you know, there's actually, if you just come to the homepage, you'll see a big promotion about Cymatics. You can pre-order it. Again, we are still waiting probably for a late, late February delivery of the books. Um, yeah. But there's, you know, just a bit about Cymatics here. There are the books in media. And by that, we mean, um, you know, the Cymatic books, the Louder Voss or Water Sound Images, the one that um, Tony actually lifted up. There's a very few left of this rare and out of print book of Hans Jenny's paintings, as wow. he was artist himself. Um, as well as two DVDs, but one of the things we recognize about the DVDs that Jeff has produced about cymatics is we don't really live in a DVD world anymore, do we? Yeah. <laughs> Everything being so streamed. So we now actually have a video section where we, four of these titles, those two DVDs of Sound, Mind, and Body, which award-winning program, as well as Cymatic Soundscapes, to bring matter to life. But then that Kellerman video, uh, the full eight minutes of it, as well as Vibrating World, Yeni 16 millimeter films are also available to either purchase or rent using Vimeo. Um, so uh, if you're interested in exploring that more, there are also four um, additional free videos that you can watch, including one um, that features um, Alexander Lauterwasser's work a little bit as well from an excerpt from a program. Could you PBS. roll up just a little bit, Chris? Yeah. That one right there, Chaos Water Sample, that mm -hmm. is showing how Yenny did his original experiments. It shows the setup of the microscope going down and the whole deal, the mirrors reflecting it off to get a two-dimensional image projected onto a screen of water being oscillated within a uh, contained lens sitting on top of, well, it had uh, um, oscillating. What we're crystal. seeing here is a small sample I would say, I don't know if that's so I hear it, but you can see a little bit of that. So I want to ask if somebody wants to do a DIY or a kid wants to take it to their science fair, um, what would you recommend people can cobble together? Um, Actually, in the book, we have uh, two different versions. Jodina is a bit of a, um, she's an author and a- Artist, isn't she? Yeah. Yeah, she's an artist and she's just uh, really fascinated by cymatics. So she has um, contributed a DIY setup that she's figured out with for just like 20 bucks worth of PVC material. Oh, excellent. Um, yep. Also, um, uh, 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 the guy who we were just talking about, um, Ralph Abram, had um, Chris created a really good uh, schematic of the uh, UCSD Hans Yeni tonoscope that they built back in, I believe it was the 60s, okay. probably late 60s. So yeah. both, both of those have um, schematics of how to build them right within the book. Oh, perfect. Yeah. Okay, so perfect. That's, a, that's an easy thing to do. That, that'd be fun. Well, uh, when the book's out, it'll be an easier thing to do. <laughs> oh, that's next month. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, well, um, so Shauna has her hand up. And then, Jeff, I know you had mentioned in the very beginning, you also had some things you had thought out ahead of time for an ending and things you wanted to make sure that got included. So be thinking of that as well so we can make sure we get that included, okay? So okay. let me ask let Sh Shoshana had to ask her question. There she is. Yeah. Welcome. Uh, your mic's still off, though. Turn your mic on. Okay. Hey. So, Jeff, I, don't, I remember... you. Years ago at, uh, in San Francisco, did you come to Ilum and talk about your book? Do you remember the uh, artists using technology group in the Bay Area, Trudy, um, Trudy Murr? Maybe not. No, I don't believe I caught that one. Anyway, your book, your book was one of the hot items for the oh, group. Oh, really? Yeah, I mean, these were a group of artists using technology, and your book came out, and I remember we all discussed it and looked at it. And I bought a copy uh, and uh, it made a huge influence on me, just um, on my artwork and getting interested in patterns in nature. Mm -hmm. But I, my question is what happens to our body or uh, when we are standing in the middle of um, like rush hour traffic the in coffee. a big, 
Yeah. I mean, you know, all these sounds that we've been looking at, these beautiful patterns, these are kind mm -hmm. of harmonic sounds. Is yeah. I remember the word harmonic sound. Right. From, yeah. But, yeah. you know, what about like um, cars honking their horns and the ambulance uh, going off? And we're living in this sea of sounds, sound, but yeah. they're not necessarily harmonics. That's right. Um, you know, again, we have a certain degree of control over what we allow ourselves to experience. Mm -hmm. um, John Bilyeu talks about it in the Sound, Mind, and Body, brilliant, brilliant depiction of how much latitude we have. We can view everything as music. Um, he says that, I have not been able to achieve that level of consciousness. When the refrigerator kicks on, I find my shoulders up around my ears and then say, oh my God, what's going on here? Uh, my sunniest room is my kitchen with a big slider. See that? Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what I do is I work in the kitchen and when the damn refrigerator comes on, I go down to the basement and throw the circuit breaker. <laughs> you know, I want to say it's not just sound. Good question, so. I remember walking down a, a city street right in the middle of Manhattan at like 3 a.m. and the static electricity, it wasn't about sound, but just the mm. buzz in the air mm -hmm. of yeah. all the technology, all the generators, all the electrical circuitry. Oh, it just buzzed. You could just feel like static electricity in the air. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. affecting us too. Right. Yeah. So. EMF is a very broad range and a lot of it's yeah. in the neural psychic range. Yeah. The, uh, yeah. And also the container is important. I was wondering about the container of semantics. Like if it's a huge pond, you know, I saw a small pond, but if it's a huge pond, would those patterns splay out bigger so that would they would be harder to notice? Yes, they would Seems dissipate. Like in a small they would yeah. dissipate. What you get, yeah. Laura Lee, when you're in a small container, the energy is contained. It's going to ricochet off whatever the boundary is. Exactly. And that yeah. will give it more opportunity to set up standing waves because exactly. you get harmonics built up within there. And the harmonics, remember you, I think it was Tony said they're they're um, riding on top of the longer, deeper sine waves. Yeah. That's what happens. You need more and more energy to generate those That's sine waves. Those sine waves because a long wave requires more amplitude than a short a high frequency yeah. so i think just, just the buildings depending. of new york you know just uh, as yeah. like containers think of all the yeah. metal the grid the faraday cage effect or whatever yeah. blah 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 yeah. um you know so your container is important sacred containers you know contain energy that's why they're boundary set a cell membrane a boundary set Earth's magnetic field, a boundary set. I mean, think about all the containers well, also and, in their effects. And it does remind me of that experiment that we participated yeah. when we went over to the ancient chapel. The in, Templar Chapel in which sacred they proportion. Put giant uh, yeah. clay pots in the walls to for mm -hmm. resonate for resonating to capture the sound. And uh, but also yeah. the chamber was in sacred geometry proportions, with John Stuart Reed was saying bounce back in a way that made the waves coherent and therefore amplified right i forget so. the name of the greek who helmholtz helmholtz they're uh, called helmholtz resonance chambers chambers because yeah. they uh, uh they put um in the building of one of the it could be the acropolis i don't know it's one of the large uh, stadium type structures in greece uh -huh. every oh uh, yeah yeah way uh so somebody on the stage can reach to the back of the, the huge. That's right. They can just speak. And because Arctic. of these mm -hmm. resonant chambers that are distributed throughout the the auditorium or the, yeah. the um, place where you'd go, mm -hmm. they would then reflect all of those back towards a central point. And yeah. you'd allow to hear. So how fascinating about, that early man's used these properties, even without knowing them scientifically, but noted their effect and used them and set them up, knew quite a lot about them. Yeah, Isn't you know, that interesting? You yeah. know, you brought up a point too, Jeff, in the very beginning, the term sacred gets thrown around a lot, but actually at its fundamentals, the idea that the ancestors were building on quote unquote sacred sites might've been purely had to do with resonance of sound, of, of, of vibration, of the, so many other elements that went into it that yeah. would, would just kind of had this catch all term of using the word sacred nowadays, but um, it's uh, just probably just a natural extension of ourselves that we are able to tune in and know the difference and, and feel these places. And yeah, this is- Oh, well, sacred gets into magic. And Shoshana, you posted in the chat room, you said the universe is self-organizing. These are com complex patterns 
that manifest and emerge when certain conditions are present, light, water, sound, sand, paint. Blah, yes. Blah. It's awesome. But you would not use the word magic to describe it. I made the point, yeah, it's laws of physics. If we saw it, it would be second nature. But because we don't readily mm -hmm. see it, it becomes magical. Do you want to elaborate on that? Your definition of magic? Uh, Shoshana? Yeah. She muted herself. Good saying. Oh, and Christopher, oh, your well, definition. I the way of magic is used a lot is just something that we don't understand. And so, uh, and it's used in a lot of different ways. I mean, we go to a magician to pull a, something out of a hat um, or, you know, some shaman or, or somebody from another culture that we don't understand does right. something. And it for us, magic. magic, it's like- Because um, we don't see the cause and effect readily. Yeah. Merlin. I mean, yeah. you know, Merlin was the magician. So- yeah. I'm just saying that that these things are for me. They're awesome. They're like breathtaking and makes my heart stop. It's like it's so awesome. It's like beyond explaining. But I don't attribute it to some um, force like God or something that is to me um, unexplainable or not part of the natural world. Just the miracle of life. I itself. agree. I yeah. agree. And the term for me, magic, just means that experience of aha, mm -hmm. right? And that's how you're using it. Chris. I agree. I and mean, that's yeah. where language becomes a real impediment sometimes because yeah. language has different meanings for different people. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so we use a word, and for us, it means one thing, for someone else, it means. And then if you look at popular media, words are just used over and over and over. Yeah, and yeah. Buzzwords, and so I'm just and lose their potency sometimes. But thank you for that. Yeah, Sorry, great question. contribution, sure. Sure. Thank sure. you. Yeah. Um, so what is your uh, sound and motion thing? Can you explain that? Can, can you come back and show us more on that? Because again, it's about the experience, about the immersion. It's about light and sound and movement. We see that in our visionary experiences all the time. Colors you can't, there's no words for. Saturated hues that are just delightful to behold. I think you're trying to, are you the light and sound, sound and motion guy? Is that yeah. you? Yeah. Yeah, so actually, and again, it's a great story of how I, I met Jeff. Um, you know, both of us are, are friends with um, a woman named Linda DeHart, who's a, uh, a, a fantastic artist here in Cambridge, Mass, who has worked with a number of different modalities, um, really since the 50s and 60s. Um, she used to do aerial sculptures, painting work, yeah. but as a, she's always been a little ahead of her time. And so in, in 2010, I actually was able to witness a, it was 2009, but Regardless, um, she took a thousand watercolors and slowly trans, basically kind of cross faded them from one to another with okay, ten so like musical scores. Morph, yeah, yeah, yeah. But at a speed that we're not used to. It's something much slower than you know. We're sort of used to media like jump cuts. You know, like oh, and we're at the next image, the next image. Oh, what like our attention actually? span. Yeah. Right. What happens when we take say ten or twenty seconds to move from one image to another? We start to actually see things and witness things in much like cloud watching um, that are, are mysterious and haven't quite formed. And then suddenly it's like, oh, it makes sense again. Or that now I see, and I she works a lot with abstract, but you, you start to see an infinite level of color, an infinite yeah. level of form. And you look away just for a second and you look back, it's different. Um, so it actually is very much is something very similar to our inner vision area experiences. So I would like to see what you've done with this. Yeah, I'm well, actually, if, if anybody's interested, experience. I can put this in the chat as well. Something called Colors and Motion. Come back to us in uh, February. Let's find a Sunday and let's just devote we it to that. that. Co let's colors that. Motion is the Yeah, because uh, I don't want to take course. away from Jeff right now, but. Yeah, like, yeah, but it's, um, it's, it's important, actually, because actually there's, a, there's another person on this call, um, Catherine oh. DeLong, who is actually a music thanatologist who has... Um, been very, very much a big fan of cymatics uh, since oh, day one. one. Who is and Catherine, Catherine also Dillon. has worked with Colors in Motion, scoring music for us and just beautiful and breathtaking oh. um, work that has just been such, such, such a gift for us as, as artists and as co-creators of experiences that really do transform us. You know, I think cymatics is, you know, and, and musicians like Catherine who recognize how much it changes us, especially with anatology, it's, you know, it's why we play in, the, in those moments, why we, you know, bring music to somebody who is in their final moments of life. Oh, it's because right. sound is the first, yeah. it's the first sense to come online and it's the last to go off. Mm. I'm not sure if everybody knew that, but that's, you know, wow. one, one I really not know powerful, that. Can we say hi to Catherine? 
understand. Yeah. No. And also the saturation of color. No. Okay, sorry. Oh, there you are, Catherine. Saturation of color. Hey, is hi, Catherine. Yeah. yeah. No. Uh, when I was in music thanatology school, the very first lesson on the first day was about cymatics. Was that with how, Therese? Yes. <laughs> yeah, okay. And how yeah. sound organizes matter. Yeah. How sound organizes matter. Yes, and I've been hauling your book around, Jeff, for a long time. Well, be glad it's that one and not this one, because it's going to be another couple of pounds and another 50 <laughs> pounds. <Heavier. laughs> we'll trade. Oh, <laughs> yeah. but, oh, it's so good to have you here, Catherine, too. And yeah, just, Catherine. Yeah, I just, I remember you sharing that with me about how, you know, that that is a, a primary lesson. It just, it, it just speaks so much to how important it is to understand that you know, the impact of music and sound on us. Mm. Um, Especially from the spectrums, from artists to physicists, from mm. scientists to, uh, you know, everyday well, people. And there's so much physics involved in all of it. Color yeah. frequency, sound frequency, sound. Yeah. But notes, even, even yeah. without having all of that knowledge, but just being someone, an experiential direct person, experience. direct experience person, mm. or someone who's working with an art, yeah. Uh, format like Catherine, I mean, delight the eyes, delight the ears. And, you know, mm -hmm. we need to put ourselves in the fields of just pure delight and bliss. Mm -hmm. And how much that can just, how much art, we'll be talking about that next week with Ivy and Susan. Good. How yes. much that impacts our neurology, yeah. wakes it up, makes it sing, produces beneficial biochemicals, puts us in a state of just euphoria. Let's, we need that medicine. Yeah. Hey, Laura. Yeah. Chris, when are you meeting with Ivy and, uh, and mid-February, so mid they're coming actually to Cambridge to meet with, with Linda and, and me and, and Jeff actually to talk a little bit more about how colors of motion works in the world. Um, oh, so it's really, it's so perfect that she's going to be on this program um, because, you know, they, she and um, you know, her, her research partner are also recognizing the amount of work that, that really can and should be done in this space. It's really been fantastic. Neglected. Over. Yeah. yeah, yeah, or it's it's. I like to think it's you know something really hopeful is is about to happen or is is starting to happen. The, the understanding that not only is art, um, you know, vital to our existence. But, um, <laughs> Thank you, really, Catherine. Yeah. Thank Don't you. Don't off yet. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, we're closing. It'd be day. nice to have the two of you come back in February. Okay. If you yeah. can oh, for sure. We'll look for some time. For, yeah. Okay. Wonderful. Nice to meet you, Catherine. Yeah. So in our uh, few remaining moments, Jeff had an agenda. We'll so, this back to you, Jeff. Jeff, what did you, how did you want to end today? Yeah. Well, there's actually closing comments from the publisher, page 300 and 301, <laughs> exactly. which is actually where the old book ended. That's the end of volume two. And then we have the commentaries. And I figured we needed a bit of a breather between having gotten through some of the densest chapters of the book and launching into the commentaries. Mm -hmm. So um, these are just printouts of the text with scribble marks and editor's corrections and things like that. So it's not gonna be a flawless performance, but it's um, three pages followed by a short poem. Okay, let's do it. Okay, closing comments from the publisher. If you are one of those rare readers who has made it this far, I mean, actually having read this book from the beginning up to this point, and that would be 300 pages at this point, then I offer you my respectful congratulations and a suggestion. Go back and review, <laughs> that's it, yeah, go back and start the book over again. Go back and review the final chapters of each volume, the basic triadic phenomena at the end of volume one, and the final chapter of volume two, historical review slash methodological preview, where he talks about where can we go from here. Mm -hmm. And the two chapters before that, if you're really into wave phenomena, where he talks about the most esoteric kinds of quantum physics that it could be imagined. In other words, this is not a book to be read once, nor even several times. So Catherine, you're going to be having to haul this one around with you too. Yeah. <laughs> Yeni's studies of animating the dust of the earth into lifelike flowing forms with an invisible force, which is largely imperceptible to our gross senses, feels like an alchemical bl blend of magic and mysticism. But upon close observation, one discovers that the causal pr principles are as precise as Pythagoras's theorems. They are consistent, 
they are coherent, and they are replicable. Yeni's cymatics is a very deliberate study, a visual representation of the creative principle, and as such, it is always changing, expanding, evolving. Unlike the inert substances that we've observed as the subjects of these experiments, we too are also comprised, even animated, by a force that is not restricted to these principles, yet which still functions impeccably within their domain. As I mentioned in my opening comments at the very beginning of this edition, I view cymatics as a living metaphor, a representation in physical phenomena of certain principles that have universal application throughout the entirety of manifest creation. A metaphor is a way of telling a story, an aphorism that translates, into, that translates an abstract understanding, for example, E equals MC squared, into concrete terms, something tangible and familiar to which we can more easily relate. Mm -hmm. As Ted Joya mentioned in his foreword, Pythagoras is reputed to have instructed his students, this stone is frozen music. Um, this was undoubtedly more accessible to his students than Einstein's abstract assertion would ever have been. Mm -hmm. Likewise, but even more so, do these cymatic images convey a profound truth in a direct and immediate way that resonates deeply within our consciousness. It does so because it illustrates in splendid detail and in real time and right before our very eyes, the invisible principles that animate our universal playground. Yes, matter is energy, but it remains inert until acted upon by some other form of energy, something qualitatively distinct yet intimately familiar to each of us. It's surely far more expansive than we can comprehend, but we can sense it directly through resonance. In Yeni's experiments, that universal energy sound is stepped down so that it is perceivable to us as sound. In the Vedas, the oldest extant texts in our four millennia blip of written Okay, sorry about that. It's okay. In the Vedas, the oldest extant text in our four millennia blip of written history, this dynamic interaction between energy and form is referred to by the Sanskrit terms purusha, the animating force, and prakriti, structure or form. I first saw these concepts articulated in Ayurvedic teachings, although I now believe them to be more that they arose from a more timeless tradition known as the light and sound teachings mm. or surat shabda yoga which are continually unfolding to this very day while cymatics is a physical study of wave phenomena that could be defined as energy or sound in this case interacting with matter with its composite of structure and form it may also be recognized as a representation of the formless emanation, purusha, made manifest through the medium of prakriti, form and structure, just as we are. Might that be why it appeals to us so intensely, why we resonate with it so effortlessly? So when the time is right, I invite you to continue your journey through the myriad expressions of cymatics by pursuing the commentaries, these, personal reflections that culminate, conclude this section. So it's these are the commentaries with people's giving their own intimate perceptions of how it's affected their consciousness, their understanding of the world and life therein. Um, these provide a synopsis ranging from rigorous analysis to playful curiosity, mm -hmm. creating a wealth of detailed research that has tantalized our awestruck eyes over the past couple of decades since we first republished Yeni's two volumes, Cannot Composite, of Cymatics in 2001. But for now, please take a well-earned respite to enjoy a bit of a palate cleanser. <laughs> this is poetry. It's called, And Sometimes Happiness.
the syncopated surging of the surf as it beats relentlessly against the shore, pounding out the rhythms of the day, a metronome just slightly out of sync, attack a little faster than decay. The sure incoming tide brings its array, building up its kingdom grain by grain, storing up vast treasures from untold distant lands that promise lasting pleasure cast in swiftly shifting sands, hoarding countless measures as its rhythms shape the day, crafting sculpted castles and then washing them away. Jeff, thank you so much. Beautiful poetry and what a nice way of combining the arts with the science and, and bringing this, this story to people's awareness. Um, yeah. And thank you to all your team. And thank yeah. you, uh, Christopher. We yeah, look forward we... to a, a future conversation with you and uh, more on the horizon, Jeff. How can people get hold of your book? Is there some bonus for an early order you What's mentioned? The website. For our group. Cymaticsource.com. Is that what it was? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So cymatic, one S-O-U-R-C-E dot com, cymaticsource.com. Yeah. <laughs> and also access to all those videos that otherwise are rentable or viable. That's or right. Available. That's right. Well, thank so, you. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Thank you for all the good work that you're uh, doing. And, you know, indeed, um, we love cymatics because it so perfectly is in harmony with our own experiences and our own work. It's really about mm. these patterns of the universe. Yeah, it's really about opening our bandwidth. It's seeing further, farther, deeper into the nature of reality and ourselves. Mm. And to find that, um, that just that assurance that as above, so below, like we're a microcosm within ourselves. of the macrocosm. We're yeah. just part of the mm. whole, the fabric. That's the, just so reassuring that we're designed by one whole universe that has some coherency and redundancy and, a pattern. A, a, a... Yeah. Well, thank, thank you, you so much. This is really fabulous. And of course, the other science I'm interested in is cloning because I need to have Chris come over here too. So <laughs> we, we, we need our own Chris. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Send your twin. Well, Chris yeah. likes to travel. So yeah. Oh, God. There's a lot of time here. traveling. Yeah. yeah absolutely wonderful. Over here. Look at all these midwives as well. Yeah. yeah. As well. Yes. Thank you, Chris, for everything. Thank you, Chris. Here. Thank you, Jeff. Good meeting you. And everybody, I've asked you to turn on your mics and please say thank you to the guests before you log off today. A little bit of applause and verbal thanks would be great. Thanks for those early Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Beautiful thank presentation. You. Thank you. Yay, thank you. Jeff. Good, Good job. job. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Yeah. Good to see a few faces on the other end here. That's great. Yeah, yeah, beautiful. I'm getting an order from PayPal right as we speak. You better, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's for me. Oh, there you go. This is. Hey, you know what? This morning, as I was going through my emails to make sure that Chris hadn't sent me anything that I needed to attend to, I saw that there was a fellow named Cop Boy, Cody Boy, something like that, from Hong Kong. Oh, who okay. wanted to uh, connect with us and show us his work. Mm -hmm. And Chris and I both responded to him separately. So we're probably going to start building up a community page for interchange back and forth that has nothing to do with me. We don't have to handle it. We just plug it in and let people talk to each other. Yes. So that is, that's going to start as soon as we can get to it. As, yeah, as soon as Chris can get to it. Yeah. yeah. Perfect. <laughs> well, no, I talk with Chris about it and get him all excited. And he says, I can do that. I can uh, do that. Yeah. We'll all right, everybody. Soon. Well, thank you so much. What a wonderful pre uh, presentation. And it's always fun to talk to you, Jeff. You know, we'll keep keep it going. We've done 30 years of discussions. We'll continue. Yeah. Love you all. Thank you. Thank you. Pay attention to what sounds surround you. Maintain your health. <laughs> Sing with yeah. the planets. Sing with the planets, yeah. Blessings. <laughs>